Um, I'm just going to start with a few words on Swiss Next Boston as usual and Julia will then introduce SIAR initiative and then we're going to dive in to how this crisis and in general we are thinking about how behaviors can change. Um, so Swiss Next Boston is the science and technology consulate of Switzerland um, here in Boston and we focus on creating networks between Switzerland and the US in the areas of research, innovation and the arts. And in the arts in particular, we do that by supporting artists, designers, cultural institutions, and art schools in expanding their reach here in North America and in finding the right partners for their programs and the right platforms to present their work. And we have partnered with SIAR Initiative to bring laser talks to Boston um, because these events, they really embody the interdisciplinary dialogue that we look for at Swiss Next Boston. Laser, for those of you who are new here, um, was initiated in California by Leonardo, the International Society for the Arts, Sciences, and Technology. And Laser Talks have grown to be a, become an international series um, of evening gatherings that bring together artists and scientists and practitioners of all fields together for informal um, presentations and conversations with a really engaged audience. So we look forward to talking about behavioral change um, with you today in this context. And Julia will tell you more about SciArt and what expects us today. Thank you so much, Alex. And yes, thank you to everyone who has tuned in. Um, we're so excited to do laser virtual uh, because the show must go on and there are always interesting cross-disciplinary conversations to be had. Um, so thanks for tuning in. For the next hour, we're going to explore shaping biology, shaping behavior from multiple different perspectives. Um, so to tell you a little bit about the SciArt end of things, we are an arts nonprofit uh, that focuses on connecting the arts and sciences through the platforms of art. So we have exhibitions, we have a residency program, and we have monthly and one-off events, much like laser, which typically happens four times a year in collaboration with Swiss Next. Um, I'm the director of SciArt and I am interested in uh, bringing everyone to the table because we really all are in this together and these big problems that our 21st century has posed to us requires a cross-disciplinary mindset. It requires the input from multiple disciplines and so laser really embodies that idea each laser we choose a theme and then we build speakers around that theme from different points of view. Um, so I would like to invite you as we hear the next four talks over the course of this hour to submit your questions through the Q&A chat box, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, we will get to questions at the end of all four talks. And, um, and we will voice them on your behalf. So if you have a question for a specific speaker or you think of one for all of the speakers, submit them in that Q&A chat box and we will get to as many as we can at the end. Um, we will be wrapping up this event around 1.35, um, just to let you know. So be sure to get your questions in there before then. And I'll hand it back to you, Alex. Yeah, because it's my pleasure to introduce um the first speaker today, Andreas Baerly. Andreas is joining us today from Zurich, um, where he is a researcher at the, um, and an economist at the COF, Swiss Economic Institute. Um, he's also an associate member of the Immigration Policy Lab at ETH Zurich, and he has co-founded Policy Analytics Switzerland, which is a startup that he will talk more about in a minute. He has conducted various evaluations and research projects on migration and labor markets and is currently working on impact evaluations concerning online labor markets, the integration of migrants and criminal justice. He received his PhD from the University of Zurich and was a research fellow at the University of California Davis and the London School of Economics and Political Science. Welcome Andreas and thanks so much for taking the time to share your thoughts with us today. Hi, thanks a lot uh, for inviting me. Um, so can you now see the screen? Yes, we can. Great. Thank you. Okay, so I would like to talk to you today about a particular evaluation I have been involved in in the criminal justice system in Switzerland that was about the importance of the right to be heard. But before I dive into this particular uh, evaluation, uh, let me quickly like um, say a bit more general what we do. 
So I have like two roles, uh, as Alexandra already mentioned. I work at ETH Zurich as an economist and researcher, and I write um, uh, papers. And on the other hand, I founded, co-founded Policy Analytics, which is a startup that tries to, where we try to support organizations, particularly in the, in the public sector, but also like NGOs and foundations, to learn more about uh, uh, and use evidence, rigorous scientific evidence, to, um, uh, to learn how, how their programs and projects work. And the way we do that is usually is in this is like pictured here. We use like existing data and research. Then we help organizations like design and prototype new interventions or new programs. And the core then is to test those uh, programs scientifically and rigorously, learn uh, uh, from the data that we got, and then help shape a new design. And uh, this can go on for a while. And if things turn out to be useful, you can scale it up for the for uh, for instance to a whole population. I will come back to that a little bit later. And the core now I have to um, how can I uh, sorry I don't uh, okay I cannot share the change the slides <laughs> so that, sorry about that. No problem. Take your time. Maybe just reset share okay. quickly. So yeah. Um, so I just do it like this. I think. So the core element is test is a scientific is a scientific test. For instance, you can think about testing a new job training program, where you have a bunch of unemployed people that are willing to test this new program. These are those, and then you assign them by lottery and either in a treatment group or into a control group. The treatment group has the benefit of testing a new program and can participate in the new program, whereas the control group is just used doing the old program. And then in the end, we compare the, the difference in the job finding rate. For instance, here we would have like 77% having a job after the new program, whereas it was only 44 in the old program. And we would say this um, is the impact of the program and uh and that's basically what we do and we do this for different organizations as i said in the private sector we have been working with uber for instance then uh in with in the government um and in the in with research institutions and ngos and today i will talk uh about the particular intervention i've been doing with the prosecutorial office in some colony and um this particular intervention was about the importance of the right to be heard. And now I want to ask the question to the audience and try to see whether we can do that uh, technically. What do you think? Why is the, why is the right to, to be heard in a, in a, in a judicial system uh, where enough, um, a defendant can uh, voice his, his perspective or her perspective? Why is this important? And what could also be the disadvantages or, or the costs of having that? So should we try to, to get some uh, Q&As here? Do you see something? So everyone um, who wants to answer that question can just answer it in the Q&A section um, on the bottom of your screens. Okay, so maybe um, it doesn't look like um, people want to answer this, uh, but let me try to continue. So why do we have the right to be heard? The right to be heard is actually uh, uh, one, of the universal, uh, one of the universal rights from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it says that everyone is entitled in full equality to, be, to, to a fair and public hearing by independent impartial tribu tribunal in the determination of his or her rights and obligations and of any criminal charge against him or her. And what is the function of this right? The right has two functions. On the one hand, uh, one function is achieving truth. 
So hearings may reveal new information and help understand the defendant's perspective and prevent mistakes that could be done in the, by a judge or by a prosecutor. On the other hand, and that's something that is a lot about behavior of defendants and uh, offenders, uh, that's very often a bit neglected, but it's nevertheless very important. Another function, this function is called procedural fairness. And uh, so like legal scholars, they think that the freedom of a disputant to control the statement of their claims constitutes the best assurance that they will subsequently believe that justice has been done regardless of the verdict. And uh, they believe also that this legitimizes the justice system and prom promotes compliance with the law. The, is the issue is two things. On the one hand, it is these two functions, or I speak particularly the second function about procedural fairness has never been rigorously tested. And uh, there is another issue. And this issue is that justice systems are overloaded with, uh, uh, um, with a lot of cases. A lot of cases, uh, particularly from small crimes, from a lot of, and, uh, a lot of small crimes like uh, driving too fast, theft, or other small violations, they overburden the justice system. And if all of these cases would go into a, a full-blown trial, that would cost a lot of resources and uh, take a lot of time. So what has been done is the different approaches to deal with this overloading of the justice system. On the one hand, the, the, just the uh, public policymaker granted more resources to courts. On the other hand, some, some uh, crimes have just been decriminalized and there are not crimes anymore. And the third approach has been to delegate power to the prosecutorial office or the police. In the US, for instance, there is the, the plea bargaining system where the prosecutor can propose a charge um, a, a, to an offender or to a defendant. And, um, and uh, if the defendant is, is, uh, is uh, fine with this particular uh, proposal, then it doesn't go in front of a, of a court. In Europe, we have, uh, in many countries that are listed below here, we have another uh, system that's called penal order procedure. And what is done is that cases also don't go in front of a judge. Uh, and these are all minor cases with moderate severity. Um, all these cases have no trial, no hearing, and no judge involved. And the only thing that happens is that the prosecutor studies the legal files from the police and the police records and issues a letter that is, looks like this here, where there's Andreas, a conviction. I'm really sorry, time. but we, we can't see your screen. Um, if you could just reshare it, because then people can see the letter. You can see my screen. Sorry about that. Thank you. Sorry. Now you can see the screen? Perfect. Sorry about that. Okay, so the question is, so this was like, this is the, pre, the penal order here that I was mentioning, the letter that you can get from the prosecutorial office. And the question is, um, can there be, can there feel, can there be full justice without uh, a full legal trial where, uh, where there is a hearing or can there not be such, can there, is, uh, is this not possible? And what we, did, what we did to find out is we designed an experiment that tries to exactly find out about this. So we worked with the prosecutorial office in the city of St. Gallen that, uh, that when, and they, they uh, so they, all the cases that came into this office from the, from the police, they were basically a, um, like split into two groups. Some cases got a hearing and some cases did not get a hearing. In the, ca in the case they got a hearing, the prosecutors would first study the legal case and then invite uh, defendants for a hearing and then decide on the verdict. In the case, in the, in the control group, they would only study the legal files uh, and then, based on that, decide on the verdict. And the question then was, what has, is there an impact uh, of this particular way of proceeding this way or this way on finding truth 
and on finding uh, on the on this there an impact on particular fairness how the how the prosecute how the justice system is perceived by by defendants so what we found we, we ran this experiment and uh, we were actually quite surprised what we found so we found that in case they uh, that they did a hearing uh, there were actually 10 percent more charges dropped so that means every 10th case uh, in this particular penal order process is a case that would not have been convicted and um, and uh, we found that most of these cases would actually got uh, either uh, a fine or a penal pen monetary penalty a monetary penalty is basically uh, a, an amount of money you have to pay and to not go to jail and uh, and we also found a small increase in prison uh, in prison sentences, but this didn't really. Uh, this was not a big, big uh, case. What we also found is that prosecutors, as expected, um, collected more information. They had more sympathy for the offender, and uh, they spent more time on the case. What was really interesting is what was the impact on the offender. Uh, and we found that actually many more pe more people know about the particular that they were convicted. This went up from it was actually surprising to us that only like six, uh, two thirds of all offenders knew that they were convicted. Convicted, and this went up to eighty percent. And we found that th they perceived the process as much fairer. They said they were more fairly treated. Their rights were more respected. Their views were better considered. There was no effect on discrimination actually in in both cases whether there were was a hearing or whether there was not a hearing they didn't feel discriminated against but they also sa said that they found that um that uh, prosecutors had more they were could make a more informed judgment and subsequently we also see a small a decrease in appeals so the, they didn't object to the to this penal uh penal order we are also collecting currently uh, data on whether they be, uh, whether they do um, become evolved again in the criminal system, but we don't have this data yet. So let me wrap up. So I think we have a historic chance of um, having much more data currently and much better evidence and tools to study data. And we use what we do is I think we use a, a technique that has been pioneered. Uh, close to Boston uh, in Cambridge, where Mike, Michael Creamer, Esther Duflo, and Abhijit Banerjee used experimental techniques to alleviate, help alleviate poverty. And we used the same techniques to study all kinds of social decision making and how uh, it can be help, used to improve um, policy making in the social sector. That's what we do. Thanks a lot for your attendance, and I'm happy to receive questions later. Thank you so much, Andreas, for sharing um, some of your research that you do. Um, so from this very you know, meta-analytical level, we're going to switch a little bit into the more concrete tool level that um, can affect us all with um, Tobias Pfor's um, contribution this, this, this evening in Switzerland and this afternoon here in the US. So Tobias Pfor is our next speaker and he is the founding and manager par managing partner of Red Rock. He also co-founded um, Digital Therapeutics, which is a startup that produces a line of products that help you optimize lifestyle choices to impact your health, positively impact your health, of course. Um, they have also developed in this context an app called Co19 and Me that helps individuals be part of the solution to this global pandemic that we're in right now. Tobias is trained in industrial engineering and he is a, a strategy a coach and entrepreneur with a strong focus on human centricity and interfaces between people, companies, and cultures. Four work, works with companies to awaken an entrepreneurial spirit within them and has built up um, numerous internal incubators and innovation programs. Tobias is also um, based in Zurich, Switzerland, and um, welcome. Thank you very much, Alexandra, for the, the very good um, introduction. 
Um, it's a pleasure to be part. And um, when Alexandra asked me to to join and, and share some insights, I, I was very honored and, and uh, very happy to to be part. <clears throat> and also with the like with a with a tagline to shape, adapt, and change the way we do things. Um, that kind of triggered what I want to share with you um, because my my heart is really much about, very much about uh, interdisciplinary um, efforts and I'm I'm a strict enemy of uh, closed innovation and a, and a big promoter of open innovation because I think we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time we do something um, it's it's much easier to jump over or kind of easier to jump over our ego or then really to get out solutions to um, to people. And actually, what I'm what I'm about to present to you was actually triggered through uh, discussions that I had uh, with with some some people at Harvard, um, where we're talking about um, digital tools to to help people to change their lifestyle. Um, we have a background with a project on um, digital blood pressure monitoring, which is possible with a smartphone camera, which we um, where we embedded some Swiss technology that allows for that. And they they just triggered this question, like, hey, with your platform can't you be doing something to to counter COVID? And I said, well, actually, yeah, why why not? Um, so yeah, it was a, a couple of phone calls to see how we can easily set that up. And I wanted to just share the, the journey with you of how we set that up within a, just a couple of weeks. Um, so our observation was actually when, when COVID hit that in the beginning, you could see a lot of reported cases um, you could see also the disease cases, and you could also see how many people had recovered from from the disease and were kind of through it. Um, after a while, the last element dropped, and we were only we, we only had access to information about the the cases, how they increased exponentially, um, and also how uh, how many people had died. Um, but it was kind of forgotten about how many people have recovered and are healthy again and possibly even immune though that question still remains open if, if there's a possibility for it. Anyhow, and then we said, there's people outside um, that don't even know what is happening in their, in their direct environment. And they are, are confined in the, in the lockdown. They have to stay home. And then other problems start popping up with, uh, with shifts in mental well-being. And that's actually when we said, um, Let's let's launch Co19 and Me because it's it's actually it's about the individual. How can the individual cope with the crisis? How can we cr uh, create transparency on an individual level? And how can we like enable people to not be passive onlookers, but to really look into how can I contribute to the the situation instead of just waiting for the government to solve something and and maybe even just complaining about it and 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 going on demonstrations. Um, and so we also wanted to find a way to move from a physical distancing to a smart distancing. Um, but let me give you a little bit of background about our platform and, and on which we also built that. So we have on one side, the, the user who has a bunch of different data. It could be from electronic health records. It could be from his activities, a smartphone, uh, smartwatches, uh, different apps. He has geodata but all kind of sit in different silos. And what we do is we aggregate the data for people and we try to in generate insights for them, sometimes even just through, through visualizing it so that people can see when they move more, that has a positive effect on their, on their blood pressure. We aggregate that data and we generate insights for organizations um, who in turn also pay us for those insights. But what we never share is the data of the individual people but we aggregate it to a level so that we can safeguard a person's anonymity and privacy. And the direction that we want to go with that is to help companies with corporate health programs to assess the health of their uh, workforce or the health of their overall organization and also see how they could improve on that and how they can target or launch new campaigns um, to not only see how many people have participated in a, in a and a campaign, but really see how they can uh, change different parameters, such as hypertension and blood pressure, such as um, also mental well-being, and so forth. Um, what we did then also with um, our setup was literally in, in three to five minutes, we had an additional data stream where we designed the, um, the questionnaire based on WHO um, guidelines. And it works in a way that the citizen contributes information 
to society um, because people can then see in a heat map what is happening in their environment. And that should trigger in them also to be honest, because if they feed in crappy data, they only get crappy insights out of it. They can't use it. So we, we trust that people are, are honest about what they put in. Um, but then also, yeah, we see that only by, by us pulling together and by us like getting over barriers that, that, are, that are confined on us, um, we can get through this. And I think we're still not through it. Um, also with um, track and trace possibilities that actively work retroactively, we still need things to know when are when are shifts happening and i'll also touch a little bit on that later how we try to to further develop that um what we set up was a purely web-based application you can reach it uh, through co19andme.com and we decided specifically for that because we saw a lot of different trackers popping up that were app-based so they were exclusive for people that had a smartphone and often they only used anonymized information. So people had to, to register with their, in, uh, with their email address and then information was, uh, was, was shared via web service. And what we have in the background is also actually Swiss technology, um, comes from one of the um, federal uh, universities. So it's a must have consent management. A user has an anonymous account to start with. It's highly secure, it's GDPR and HIPAA compliant. And then based on that, we, we set up different questionnaires. Um, and we also develop further um, collaborations then with partners that have different puzzle pieces that can um, yeah, really help in, in, uh, in moving forward. Let me just quickly also show you the solution itself for those who haven't um, already logged in by now. Um, we have a simple front to explain what our intention is. Um, you join it you have a um, an anonymous account the id is actually generated from the back end you put in your password and you sign in so it's pretty much like uh, um, also a, a blockchain wallet um, as soon as, as long as you keep those two components the id and the password you have access to it um, but we have the, the possibility to add an email but that purely for the purpose of communication and password reset and then we just go through a very simple questionnaire. Do you feel healthy? Yes or no. And even if you feel healthy, it's important to, to register that data so that you can really see how things might shift over time. You go in, you might um, select some of the, the, the symptoms that you have or even the severity of those um, because also there's different stages of that you, that you go through things. Um, and it's also interesting to see when do symptoms peak and also when do they, um, they go back? Um, of course, right now I, I do feel healthy, um, so I don't put any um, symptoms. There's also some, some closing questions. Have you been tested for COVID? Um, have you been uh, suspectedly been in touch with people that, that might have it and so forth? And then you get a first assessment um, of your symptoms. Um, it's, it's based on Informatica. Um, API that we integrated because also there we said we don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's so many solutions out there. So let's just bring it all together. And then for now, we also have a, um, a map where you see um, data pulled from different um, directories. Um, you see the cases, you, you see the, the deceased people, you see also the recovered people and how many tests have been performed. And then what we want to expand in the future is that you can really dial in on a zip code level and then see what is happening over time. You then have the possibility to go to your, your profile. You have generic information that you can add um, also if you have pre-existing conditions. And then um, what you get then below it is um, a summary of your symptoms, or actually you get the, the dashboard to follow your own symptoms over time to just keep track of it for yourself. So you can, you can follow your temperature, you can see how does it, um, how does it change over time. And uh, also so that you could see not just a flat line, I put in some, some information so you can see how that changes over time. And what we're planning to add here over time is different data streams. So such as activity levels, sleep levels, blood pressure, 
um, and also mental health, because we see there's a lot of shifts in mental well-being right now. People are challenged by the um, isolation. People are challenged by um, the insecurity and the, the lack of transparency. And we look at how can we then help companies to um, yeah, help people in a, in a much better way. So let me quickly go back to my presentation here. So what were the main challenges for us? Um, it was first and foremost to keep the right focus. Um, because there were a lot of different possibilities popping up. We, we talked to people um, both at um, and, and Boston and also here in Switzerland about track and trace possibilities um, and to see how could we uh, how could we integrate that. And there's a ton of possibilities that we could do, but we said let's let's focus on simplicity. Let's try to get a, a solution out uh, as fast as possible. Um, but we also realized that we need to be even though there is a, a high time pressure, we need to be very specific so that the developers know what is actually, uh, what is important and what they can focus on. Um, unfortunately also there, we had some loops, so we lost some precious time um, in getting the, uh, the information or the, the, the possibility out. Um, then the main challenge was access to resources and short-term funding. Um, but what was surprising again for me that yes, money does help, um, but it's not necessarily the first solution. Uh, we partnered with over 15 people in the hackathon versus virus here in Switzerland, where over 5,000 people participated over a course of 48 hours. And I was just amazed by how easily you can connect with people that have um, a joint vision and that want to tackle a problem jointly. And we had people that worked till like three o'clock at night um, to get a solution out quickly, to do research, to, to get in touch with possible users. And that's, that's a commitment you, can, you can't actually buy with money, or it's, it's very expensive. And that short amount of time to get that funding up and running is near impossible. Um, then also in the course, we, we also identified people internationally that are in the impact space. And we actually got um, two to four weeks worth of, of um, coding donated by a company that said, hey, we believe in what you're doing and we want to support you. And they supported us with three, four different um, coders, really helped us to push the, the, the solution out. And then we also see that ego seldom really helps the customer. Um, it's very important to not just build your solution, but to build a solution that is important for your customer and that helps the customer in the first place. Um, and that's why, yeah, we're a big fan of, of looking who's out there, who can we partner with, who has the same spirit, and how can we um, help the people around us and us included. Um, the key learnings for us, uh, that actually co 19, it's not the main problem. Um, I see that it's the lack of transparency about oneself. So often, when a crisis happens, you need to know where are you standing, what is happening around yourself. And, Often, there is a lot of data available and information, but it's siloed, it's hidden, and you don't know about it, um, or you don't even know how to access it. And that leads me to another point, that there is quite of a lack of, of health and digital literacy. So people often don't even know how to, how to uh, counteract the crisis that goes against uh, people's health. And then also, with a lot of new solutions coming out, people sometimes don't even know how digital systems work. And we need to know, uh, and, and we need also need to increase people's literacy so that they can be empowered, that they can be at the table and, and be part of the solutions instead of just being passive onlookers. Um, we also found out, and, and it, it strengthened our hypothesis that people and organizations are interested in leveraging digital tools, but they have to be very simple. They have to be very straightforward and you also have to be very transparent in what you're trying to do uh, with the data, uh, which is often not very easy to, to do, to, to be as transparent as possible, um, but we're working on that. And then we also realized that um, health and, and proactive investment into it um, needs to be much more incentivized because I think right now we see that the, the healthcare system that we have, and, and surprisingly, it is called healthcare system, but it's much more of a sick care. Um, 
there is a disbalance in how people invest into into their health and often only after they lose quality of life then they invest into it but then they have to recover the the, the cost of it so we want to we want to help there and shift the investments onto the the preventive side and what we're actually trying to build now is a mild and more for preventive health so that people can be much more active um, but that they have a personal incentive for their health but then also to help corporates to assess their their overall health and also to incentivize them to invest into their workforce and to uh, to bring them forward so that brings me to to closing i'm looking forward to hearing your questions um, and if you have solutions or, or ideas and you want to join forces with us um, feel free to reach out thanks a lot Thank you so much, Tobias. It was fascinating. Sounds like a really important and uh, full of potential digital tool. Um, so I hope Thank you. everyone goes to, to his website after this talk. Again, if you have questions for any of our speakers throughout these talks, please submit them in the Q&A chat box and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Right now, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Amy Buker is an organizational psychologist and the vice president of behavior change design at mad pow in boston massachusetts her research interests include motivational design and self-determination theory social relationships connections and their effect on well-being and performance happiness and resilience and health behaviors such as medication adherence and physical fitness Beaker's recently published book engaged designing for behavior change offers practical tips for design professionals to apply the psychology of engagement to their work. She earned her master's in psychology from Harvard University and her PhD in organizational psychology from the University of Michigan. So welcome, Amy. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here today. Um, I just want to talk briefly about motivational psychology. So um, really one of the core interests in my career um, but I, I think it's a really useful framework to use right now, especially in this time of COVID-19, when we're asking people to make some really significant behavior changes in order to limit contagion. It's really important to understand how people are motivated and the ways that we can frame interventions, whether it's a, you know, a digital program or more of an experiential type intervention, like some of what's coming out of our cities and our states in the United States, where they're asking us to adopt different types of behaviors. And then using that lens to help frame the interventions in a way that really works with the way that people's behaviors are motivated. So this comes from self-determination theory, which is about 40 years old and has a really rich research base. I find myself reaching for it often because it has such a strong evidence base and so many years of application in different domains. So I feel a high degree of confidence that this does an adequate job explaining the way that people behave and interact with their environments and each other. And one of the core tenets of self-determination theory is that when you think about motivation, it's not just whether somebody has a little or a lot of it. It's what is the source of that motivation, which is what they refer to as motivational quality. And the basic idea here is that the more that the source of a person's motivation is autonomous, it's personal to them and comes from inside, the stronger it is to drive behavior change over the long term. And so you think about a controlled source of motivation, which is something that's external to the person. And we're seeing a lot of that where there are you know, warnings and expectations set up of people and their behaviors. And there's sometimes a little bit of an I told you so. And people will often comply with these kinds of things for a short period of time. But when it becomes difficult to sustain, and we're seeing that now, um, you know, here where I live in Boston, we're in our, I think, ninth or 10th week of stay at home. And that's really difficult for people to be separated from their normal lives, from their workplaces and their friendships. And so when it gets really hard to sustain those behaviors because you're missing the alternative, if your only reason for doing it is this external, because somebody told me to, that's where you start to see people you know, not, not withholding or not upholding those rules anymore. The people who have more of these autonomous forms of motivation, who are thinking about goals that they really value. So, you know, this is something that I believe is important in order to be a good parent or a good family member or a good community member or what, you know, maintain my own health. The people who have a sense of identity, they, they see this as consistent with who they are on a larger, more value-based scale. Um, those are the people who are gonna be better able to make it through some of these obstacles that the behaviors are presenting to us. So, 
I think it's really useful to think about what is the source of a person's motivation, especially in this time when we're asking them to make really significant behavior changes. When we think about shaping an experience that nudges people to the more autonomous motivation part of this continuum, self-determination theory tells us that every human being has three basic psychological needs. And so if we can design an experience to support these three needs, we're more likely to help people connect with those personally meaningful reasons for doing something. The three, reason, or the three basic psychological needs are autonomy, so being able to make your own meaningful choices. Competence, so feeling like you're taking action in the world and there's some kind of response or feedback that's letting you know that you're being successful, you're making progress in some way. And then relatedness is feeling connected to others, feeling like you're part of something bigger than yourself. And all of us experiencing the current situation with the pandemic know personally that this is not a situation that on its face fosters any of these three needs. We're really um, having a lot of control taken away from us. We're being asked to not be active. We're being asked to take in action. And that goes against the way that our brains are wired to see that we're effective in the world. And we're feeling separate from people. So we really have this challenge when we think about intervening or creating a program to help people keep themselves safe and keep others safe from COVID-19, where we need to think about ways that we can craft experiences that bring these variables back in. So um, as I just said, the steps to limit contagion in a, in a pandemic, they are in many ways in opposition to our motivational mechanics. It offers this very, um, you know, very serious and, I mean, it, it's intellectually interesting, but it's, it's a very serious challenge for behavior scientists as well as others to think about how we can craft interventions that still support people's basic needs. So a few just high level tips to think about. With autonomy, one of the things that we can think of as a design principle when we're creating interventions and creating the language around interventions is how can we show people that they matter? How can we restore to them the sense of, uh, you know, it's not just that you need to be one of the masses and doing things because we said so, but you're doing this because it helps support things that matter to you. I mentioned before the people who think about taking steps to limit contagion because they want to be a good family member or a good community member, maybe better equipped to maintain social isolation over the long term. Those are the sorts of messages that we wanna share with people. There was recently a pilot done by some behavior scientists that I know where they created a contain COVID pledge that they put on social media. And they used different contexts when they posted it to see which ones would get the greatest response. The one that didn't work was, I'm going to keep myself safe from COVID. The others, which were about, I'm gonna keep myself and my family or I'm gonna keep my community safe. Those were the effective framings because we really respond to this idea that our behaviors matter. Um, this idea and my actions making a difference. So I mentioned again, we're asking people to be inactive in a way. We're asking them to stay home. Um, you know, don't do your normal things. Don't go out, don't go talk to people. And then the result on the end of that is that we will not see more infection. So that's a really interesting evidence case where we're used to doing something and then seeing a reaction and here we're doing nothing. And if it's successful, we see no reaction. So how can we think of ways to frame the situation and make it feel like a more active choice on the part of people? How can we present evidence that is in the positive? And it may be things like, you know, stories of people who are thriving in this situation and doing so because others are making the choice to stay home and protect the community from contagion. And then the third one may be the easiest to approach in this time, which is to show people that they're not alone, even if they are physically separate in this time. So I think we're very fortunate that this situation is happening at an era where we have technology that can bring us together like we all are, are here today. And I also think there's a role for really sharing some of the authentic messiness that comes from living in this situation that we might not otherwise feel comfortable doing. So I, I've personally seen some blurring between the professional and the personal that isn't typical in a workplace or in conversation with people you don't know well, but I think it's actually in the service of a greater goal of helping people to feel connected in this time with us, really important. So just to flash back to this, our job as interventionists, part of our job is to do our work in a way that helps people reconnect with what matters most, helps draw them back to their most meaningful values and their identity. And to think about those three types of identification that fall on the, um, or three types of motivation that fall on the autonomous side, these are just kind of guiding questions that I've been keeping in mind as I tackle individual projects and opportunities to help people make behavior changes in this time. So 
identified motivation is about those personally meaningful goals. And how can we help people think about who and what they're protecting by limiting the spread of COVID-19? How do we help them look around them and see the people who are important to them, the institutions that are important to them, the community that they live in that they can help preserve by taking action now or inaction now? Integrated motivation. This is about your identity, your values, your sense of who you are as a person. And we can do a lot to help people think about writing their story in this time. What is it that your behavior right now is going to say about you? What's the story that you're going to tell your grandchildren about how you contributed to a positive outcome in this, in this time? And then intrinsic motivation, I didn't touch too much on this before. I, I actually don't see this a lot in my work because a lot of times when we're looking at behavior change, asking someone to do something new, that's inherently uncomfortable. And intrinsic motivation is all about something being pleasurable in its own right. So, you know, when you're in that moment of friction and trying something new and learning and, and failing, because that's part of learning, you may, you may not experience that. But we have an opportunity in this time when people are staying at home and staying separate to find moments of peace and pleasure. You know, how can you reconnect with some of the things that previously you may have been too busy or, um, you know, too on the go to really spend time with? So it might be just waking up early in the morning with your cup of coffee and experiencing your own backyard or, or what's going on in the street in front of your home. It may be the chance to really, um, you know, spend time in conversation with people who otherwise you don't have the time for and making the effort to focus in on those moments of pleasure because that is one of the benefits of this. And if we can seek out those moments and draw some of that um, motivation out of it, it will help sustain us for the long haul, which unfortunately it looks like will need to happen. So um, with that, thank you. This is my contact information. I'm happy to, to chat further and I'm looking forward to some of your questions. Well, thank you so much, Amy. That was wonderful. Um, and, a, and a good reminder to find those moments of kind of intrinsic um, happiness and joy. Um, so the last couple of talks, we've been circling around behavioral change in the Duke judicial system, personal health tracking, personal behavior. Um, now we're going to switch gears a little bit and, and head to the arts uh, with David Goodsell. So it is my pleasure to introduce David Goodsell. He is a professor of computational biology at the Scripps Research Institute and a research professor at Rutgers University in New Jersey. As a structural biologist, Goodsell focuses on the study of HIV biology in the structure and function of bacterial cells. He is well known for his watercolor paintings of cell interiors, which integrate information from structural biology, microscopy, and biophysics to simulate detailed views of the molecular structure of living cells. Goodsell earned his BSc in biology and chemistry at the University of California, Irvine, and his PhD in biochemistry at the University of California, Los Angeles. His wonderful images, um, is the image for this laser event. So you've already seen some of his work, even if you're not familiar with it yet. Um, so I will let you take it away, David. You have to unmute your microphone first though, so we can hear you. That would there help we a go. lot, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, many thanks, Julia. It's a real, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, let me see if I can get this to work. And this. Are we good with the slides? Okay, so um, I, I'm just going to talk a little bit today about some pictures I've been doing lately. And as you can imagine, I've been doing a lot of pictures of coronavirus. And uh, most of this work uh, I've been doing as part of outreach work uh, for the RCSP Protein Data Bank, um, helping people uh, get some context for the science that's uh, that's stored in the in the PDB archive. And so this uh, this first picture here I did uh, back in the early days of the pandemic, back in uh, in February, uh, and it's based mostly because there wasn't a lot of information at the time. Um, it's based on the the 2003 SARS, and the new uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, is is turning out to be very much the same. And so the goal of this uh, illustration was. Uh, just to capture a portrait of the virus, you know, to give people more of a personal touchstone of, of what it might look like and um, realize that it's a physical entity, you know, that we can understand uh, and hopefully find ways to, uh, to fight. And so the, the picture out here on the outside, all in green, is the, 
uh, respiratory mucosa. So it's trying to show um, the virus in, a, in the context of where it might actually be uh, as it starts infection. The little yellow guys out here are antibodies and these long green things are mucins. Um, and the, the virus itself is pretty simple, right? It, these uh, spikes, that probably everybody uh, <laughs> on the, the, uh, the call here is familiar what it, with what it looks like by now because the pictures are everywhere. There are these spike proteins on the outside uh, that, that give it its crown-like shape uh, and all the uh, nucleic acid in the middle here. So I put the word integrative in the title here uh, because these pictures are very much what I try to do is uh, capture the current state of knowledge of the particular subject and then create an integrative illustration that tries to um, bring all of that information together. Uh, and so I'll just I can get this to go forward. This is not working. Oh, there we go. This is the kind of information that goes into uh, these paintings. Uh, if there's atomic information on what the different proteins look like, I use that. So here's a, um, a structure of the spike protein held at the, uh, in the, the PDB archive. Um, if there aren't uh, atomic structures of things, I go to places like Uniprot, where they have sequences of the proteins. Uh, and so this one here is showing me that the membrane M protein uh, has several segments that are um, across the, the viral membrane and a big domain here that sticks on the inside of the, the virus. So I'll draw a shape that um, has a, a bit going through the membrane and a big blob on the, the inside. Um, here are a whole panel of wonderful electron micrographs, uh, which um, I use to make sure that the, the membrane is the right size. And if you kind of squint here, you can see all those spikes. And so that'll make sure I get the number of those spikes correct. And then over here is something from my own research, um, working on what the, um, the molecular structure of the uh, DNA nucleocapsid protein is on the inside. So this is a coarse grain model that I've been uh, working on trying to figure out that uh, complex um, structure. And so when I create these illustrations, I try to bring all of this stuff together and then draw it all up at a consistent um, style and a consistent magnification, it essentially creating a portrait of the virus. Uh, so here's the obligatory process slide. Uh, just showing what, what I do in my studio. Um, all the integrative science happens at this stage of uh, putting together a sketch of where everything is going to be. Um, uh, over here, transferred to a piece of watercolor paper and then just with this little tiny brush, filling in a bunch of colors. Um, here's the stage where the, the virus is done and I'm starting to, to fill in the, uh, the mucosa here. And finally, over here is the final picture. Uh, so let's move on. Uh, so later, I uh, um, set myself a much larger goal, which was to look at the, uh, the life cycle of the virus. And so the, um, the goal of this very complicated picture is to try to show all the different um, proteins that are encoded in the viral genome. Uh, what they're actually doing as the virus replicates, okay? And so I'm hoping that this can be kind of a, a map uh, that we can use down the road as people start developing therapies that target these different proteins, um, just so we'll know where it's happening. And so down, let's see if I can get my mouse to work, down here is the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, the, um, the virus uh, during the course of reflection, uh, infection, uh, induces the formation of these really wacky uh, membrane structures inside the cell. This is called the double membrane vesicle, uh, which is pulled out of the, the ER. Um, and up here, these little guys are the uh, enzymes that are involved in replicating the viral genome. All the purple strands are the viral RNA strands encoding the information. Those are all organized by nucleocapsid over here virus buds into endosomes and forms these infectious viruses over here. So it's kind of showing the whole story. Over here in the ER, proteins are being made. Up here, the RNA is being made. 
that's being packaged over here to form the infectious virus. Uh, and so, but it also shows one of the big mysteries of um, uh, the virus right now, which is these double membrane vesicles. Uh, people think now that they're full of viral RNA. Um, and so we need to figure out somehow how this RNA gets from here to here. You know, do these uh, membranes uh, dissociate and reassociate? Uh, are there pores that it can get through? People don't know. Uh, right now, these two, these two uh, spaces are completely separated topologically from each other in the cell. This uh, picture was also a big artistic challenge for me. <laughs> it's a classic example of trying to make a picture that has, trying to show too many things at once, right? Uh, and so this on the left was using colors that I use on a lot of uh, different paintings. Uh, and what I tried to do was to show all the cellular host proteins in blues and greens and all the viral proteins in these purples and reds. You can see it's a total mess. You can't see anything about anything. Um, over here, uh, I just darkened up the RNAs to try to make them a little more apparent. And then in this final state, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm uh, loosening my rules about colors here and drawing a bunch of the viral proteins that are in the membrane here in green, just to make these membranes a little bit more, um, the membranes a little more apparent that they're, they're continuous. So uh, that was a big challenge. Um, this was probably the, the most fun and probably useful aspect of, of this whole project, uh, which was with the, uh, with the, the PDB, the RCSB PDB, with their uh, PDB 101 uh, outreach portal, we did a coloring book version of that first painting. Um, and to me, this is, this is the way that really uh, showed most engagement with, uh, with the people that we're trying to reach. And so here are a few of the wonderful things that came back on Twitter after we, uh, um, after we put this up. Uh, and I mean, ranging all the way from uh, probably a four-year-old up to um, adults uh, uh, coloring these things in. And uh, I'll just share with you uh, that I, I just started a Twitter account last year and it's actually been completely wonderful in that um, I'm having much more contact with the people that use my paintings. Um, and so here are some of the comments that came back uh, about the original painting. Um, and pretty much all of them had this uh, theme of, gee, this is really pretty, but it's really scary. You know, this kind of dichotomy. It's made me think a lot about um, uh, what what my own aesthetic and coloring scheme, uh, um, what it's uh, what it's trying to promote, what what message I'm trying to give here, uh, since I'm kind of approaching this from the um, uh, from the angle of being a scientific illustrator and to show the science rather than coming up with an emotional piece that'll make people scared of the virus. Um, so, anyways, uh, got a bunch of those questions of gee, it's pretty, but it's scary. Um, and maybe, gee, it's pretty and it's making it a little less scary, which to me is, is a really nice uh, uh, consequence. Uh, for the coloring stuff, I got these truly inspiring messages back, back from people, um, from people that were using the coloring thing in their homeschooling with their children. Um, and so, I mean, this, this is exactly what, what I want to do with everything I do. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, and one more. Last slide here is just a, a little shout out to um, over at the RCSP PDB and this PDB, PDB 101. We have a growing set of resources, including that, that coloring book and these, uh, these paintings I showed, um, and then some more informational resources that, that dive a little deeper into the individual proteins and uh, the way the scientific community is uh, designing therapies to uh, that target them. And then over here is a, a contest that we're right in the middle of this month, uh, asking people to draw pictures of coronavirus with a new tool we have for uh, uh, digital painting. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, David. It's
it's really wonderful to have that tour, you know, through through your creative process um, and to see how other people have started creating because of you and, and maybe started to understand this virus in, in a different way, um, which is really just so valuable and, and wonderful to see. So, um, so now we are at the Q and A portion of Laser. Um, as usual, our talks are wonderful and we're over time. So we're gonna extend time a little bit. So to all the audience members out there, if you'd like to hang in with us for a few extra minutes, um, we're gonna take some time to, to get to some of your questions. Um, first, I would like to pose a question to all of the panelists. Um, can you give us an example of a time when your work has influenced behavioral change in someone and uh, how it motivated your you to continue working on your project or doing that type of work. So whoever wants to go first, uh, just feel the free to jump in there. <laughs> I do a lot of research with the people that I'm designing for. And so I've had a few experiences over my career where I have conducted an interview and I usually do um, about an hour in depth one-on-one -on -one interviews. And the person has actually reflected to me during that interview process that as a result of our conversation, they're thinking differently about their behaviors. And um, I, I probably had that happen maybe five or six times over my career, spaced it maybe two years apart each time. And I feel like it's the universe spacing it um, just at the right time for me to feel like, yes, I'm making a difference, not just in what I design, but even in the process of learning in order to design it. Those conversations and letting people know that I really care about their experiences and um, you know, wanna make something that works for them and not just something that I'm an expert imposing on them. Um, so th that's been my experience with it. Anyone else want to jump in there? We have plenty of other questions, so. <laughs> um, so, sort of inside for me, maybe not directly on, on the behavior of change, but um, with the platform, and I mentioned it earlier for the, the optical blood pressure monitoring, um, I, I then bumped into people um, or who reached out to me and said, oh, cool, you're behind this project. I've been using this app for, for a while. It really helped me. And that is that is really rewarding because given that our platform is anonymous, we don't know who's on it um, because we, we safeguard people's privacy. But then it's it's cool to see how it can help and, and to get direct positive feedback um, also of, of people that, that complain when we oversimplify the application or when we take different uh, features out of it. Yeah, I can also um, say like, the, currently, we're presenting the results that uh, some of them I showed you from the experiment that we did with the prosecutors. And actually, they were quite surprised, uh, not so surprised about the effect, effect we found on the verdict, which was like some that surprised us that they were not surprised. But on the other hand, we found that the people that li liked the, re the, the, the hearings that much that was like a, a staggering result for them. And, uh, and also to other people that are practicing law is something that they, that they find quite amazing. So, and it's kind of interesting to see, you know, like you do this stuff and it's mostly with your computer and then you reflect back to the people and bring these results back to the people. It's kind of, that's really rewarding to, to see that they can actually use that and, uh, and use it to, to design, uh, help inform policy and then change policy making. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna start getting to some of the many questions that we have in from the audience. I apologize, we will not be able to get to all of them. <laughs> um, but to, uh, to start, uh, Andy, you spoke about how your research contributes to changing the judicial system. Can you give us an example of some of the work you do with policy analytics that touches upon individual behaviors? Um, yeah, let me think. So something I do currently with policy analytics is uh, we, we advise foundations how they can reach the or how they can improve the impact of the projects that they fund and uh, how they can measure the impact. And most of these projects are like helping disadvantaged groups like disabled people or like refugees 
or poor people or people that don't have jobs to 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 get jobs or to integrate better into society or any of these kind of things and um so what we do is we really go through them with the process and see how how they can improve measuring the impact that they do in these programs and and then learn how to improve them and that's really cool great thank you um a question for tobias how broad does the use of co19 and me need to be in order for it to be effective and how are you incentivizing individuals to use it Sorry, could you repeat the, the beginning of the question? Sure. Um, how broad does the use of CO19 and ME need to be in order to be effective? So how many users um, and how are you incentivizing individuals to use it? Right. So it's it's a very good and, and, and tricky question because, of course, in, in order to, to have informa like information on a zip code level, we need a lot of people to participate in that. And uh, that is also the biggest challenge that we have to incentivize people to, to get them in enough information. So it's a, a huge marketing race for us to, to, to get out. And that's also why we're partnering with people. Um, but then to, um, to, to share some background, um, I mean, Co-19 and me, we're not a, we're not a COVID or, or pandemic fighting uh, company. So that's not our core business. And uh, we hope that this thing is over uh, sooner than later. And for us, actually, it's, it's a showcase to, 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 to aggregate people's data, to make it visible, to make it also um, impactful on a, on a personal level. And we want to push that much more into a direction on incentivizing people's um, yeah, preventive health to aggregate data for them, to generate insights. So that would have first be a, a first incentive and um, and I, I mentioned earlier miles and more and, and that might not be made well known but it's it's basically a loyalty program where you can when you um, behave in a certain way or when you change your lifestyle in a way that has clinical um, evidence that it's beneficial for your for your health and you receive points and then those points you can redeem with certified partners that in turn also have um, an impact on your health and that is basically how we want to incentivize people to to put much more effort on their um, on their health to to help also aggregate data um, and and to help them in in being empowered and in, in increasing their literacy great thank you and, and speaking of you know incentivizations um, Amy there's a question in from the audience for you about uh, whether you've had any thoughts on whether these different motivational frameworks um, played into the response to COVID in different countries which have had drastically different rates of infection and mortality due to the virus. Yeah, so to my knowledge, there hasn't been any country that has taken behavior science um, and particularly motivational science into account in framing their response. But I think that the countries where we've seen a more successful response have somewhat naturally fallen into this kind of approach because of some of the cultural expectations that already existed. And I think in some cases because of the trusted position that their leadership had with respect to the population. Um, one country that did explicitly involve behavior science and it didn't, didn't go especially well was the UK. So um, they have a behavioral insights team that does a lot of government work. They tend to be very focused on a behavioral economics toolkit, which is about shaping the environment to drive a particular type of decision in the immediate, uh, you know, in the immediate context. So it's been very successful with things like um, organ donations, getting people to sign up to be organ donors, or getting people to pay their parking fines in a prompt manner. But um, the way that that toolkit was applied in this situation, I think, overlooked some of these motivational dynamics. And because this is such an ongoing and such a, a deep-seated sort of change, there was some backfire in, um, if you're interested in looking that up, you, you can see there's some editorials and things that came out of the UK around, you know, should behavior scientists even have a voice in this? And I think the answer is definitely yes, but we need to look at our broader toolkit to do that. Andy, did you want to respond to that at all? No, I found it also very interesting. Like, I also think like behavioral scientists can contribute a lot to 
you know, getting the message right and uh, like in, like improving trust, like in contact tracing apps and uh, and like go doing the right messages. And I was also actually in touch with the BIT about because I was worried that people don't uh, comply with uh, like con like uh, social distancing here, uh, or a lot of people were like very very um, very nervous about that in the beginning. And then I heard that they were like doing working like with with uh, influencers uh, and TikTok on uh, in uh, in Italy, and I found that quite cool. Uh, but I didn't hear back from them. So, but I found it like great that they were like like. Yeah, incentivizing the young young people to do that. And I do want to say, I think that in general, they do really good work. And I, I don't want to come across as overly critical of them in this. I think that, you know, they were asked to respond very quickly to a really complicated situation and, mm -hmm. you know, did the best that they could with what they had. So they, they generally are, are fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> uh, great. And um, we're going to take in one last question for David. Um, so we have a question in asking how literal are your artworks? Do you take a license when it comes to color and shapes? Does this matter for the ultimate goal of your art making and the messaging within it? Um, also, by the way, you just have a lot of fans out there, people saying, I love your work, etc." <laughs> so just know that as well. But yeah, talking about kind of the line between depiction and aesthetics. Yeah, so there's a ton of artistic license in this. The colors are all made up uh, just to try to get the, um, the concepts that I, I want to get across. Uh, the, I try to, to make the sizes and shapes and everything pretty consistent with the, the science. So for instance, going directly from, you can think of them as being a, a super realistic electron micrograph. <laughs> You know, that, that's what I'm trying to do. But they're very much in the realm of uh, scientific illustrations and using whatever tricks I need to do to get the, the science across. And to get people to, you know, engage with your images, right? Because that, that's the point of them. Um, I and, so. <laughs> and clearly they are. <laughs> um, Twitter is a great vector for that right now. Um, it has been. So unfortunately, that is all the time that we have questions for. As usual, Laser is great at starting dialogues that we should all continue to have with each other afterwards on Zoom and you know, in our, wherever we may be in the world. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. I'll hand it over to Alex to wrap us up. Yeah, speaking of engagement, we look forward to engaging with you all at our next Laser which we were hoping would be in person. It's looking like it might be virtual again, but you will hear um, from us shortly. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you, David. Thank you, Andreas. And thank you, Tobias, for all of your really interesting input, um, really talking about this, it, this topic of um, behavioral change from such different perspectives. So I think we had a really nice spread um, of different perspectives today. Um, I'd like to also just, um, have a big shout out to everyone who's working on this event behind the scenes, who are even less visible right now than they usually are. Um, so Alex um, doing the communications for this event and um, Lemon doing all of the event logistics behind the scenes and the whole Swiss Next team for all of your valuable input and feedback um, also for speaker selections. So thank you so much, everyone. We look forward to engaging with all of you in the future on different channels and hopefully in person soon. And I hope everyone in the States has a great afternoon and a great weekend. And yeah, enjoy your Friday night in Switzerland and Europe. <laughs>